good afternoon. Very good. He, very dear listeners who have joined us in this uh, African uh, Peace and Security Annual Conference, Conference on Peace and Security in Africa, APSACO. This panel on this event, APSACO event and conference, for those who have been following the proceedings over the last years of the uh, Policy Center for the New South, is a way for the new for the Policy Center to uh, reaffirm its position through these major events, what we call the uh, highlights of Africa, uh, APSACO of the Policy Center, like, like APSACO and the uh, Atlantic Dialogue. So this is a, quite a tradition that is now instored by the Policy Center for the New South, as we, as our, all our listeners and audience, uh, are now used to have two major events, APSACO and the uh, release of the uh, social and political report of Afri Africa. So we wish to thank wholeheartedly the Policy Center for letting us and dedicating this session to for us to be able to introduce to you the uh, political report and economic report of Africa. This is the first fourth version of the report describing the geopolitical Africa in 2020 during the pandemic year, and we will elaborate on this. Something, another important point that should be highlighted is that the annual convening of the event and the annual issuance of uh, the report is not a monotony. This is not just about automatic production of a report on an annual basis, but a, a monitoring rather, a uh, accompaniment and coaching of the uh, continent in its uh, evolution. So this panel is now taking place in the framework of APSACO uh, that will introduce the fourth version of the report, the 2020 report that African authors have allowed us to build. Um, we have approximately 25 uh, authors uh, for uh, many chapters. For those of you who will have the opportunity to see this version, you will see that we are right at the heart of what we call it the policy uh, center, the Afro-realism. And what it is what it is that we're talking about when we talk about Afro-realism is the very fact of uh, really taking a step back from an Ethiopian Euthopi type of image and perception of you of Africa uh, saying that Africa is the best in the world and also taking a step back from the negative uh, uh, perception of Africa that is demotivating so uh, the report uh, and the authors of the reports have seen and have perceived and describe Africa as they see it. What is unfolding and not unfolding, they have covered regions and thematic political and governors, uh, govern governance issues and thematics. Of course, I would not be the only one to introduce the report. And for this, the introduction of the report, I'll have on my right-hand side, Mrs. Natasha Khroni, a former minister of an ambassador of His Majesty the King, and currently a senior fellow at the Policy Center. She is the author on, of the chapter on Europe. And on my left-hand side, Mr. Shagrawi, a history teacher and vice dean of uh, the Institute of Governors and Economic and Social Science, that is also an author of a chapter. And along with my two guest speakers, we're gonna be walking through the um, African landscape in 2020 and discuss, of course, sometimes we will 
agree to disagree. So get ready to a kind of a hot match and and I will start with Mrs. Nazar Shakhrini. Some of you would argue that we'll always start with women, so ladies first. Well, I would say I was, will start by a person and a character. This is a first time that we see her participate, participate to a geopolitical report. So, so Mrs. Nazar Shakhrini, you're taking part for the first time to this report. You've seen it, you've discussed it and brainstormed it with your colleagues. It was quite, an, uh, quite a busy discussion preparing and drafting this report. Thank you very dear colleagues. Actually, it's really thanks to you and it was upon your initiative, you asked me uh, to participate and I was very happy uh, to accept because uh, it really coincided with my very deep uh, willingness and ambition to work on the African continent that is dear, hard, so dear to our heart, and is also a priority at the Policy Center for the New South. So this report is extremely important in different ways because we as researchers, we need to uh, kind of build knowledge with a uh, an African vision, with our own glasses, with our own eyes, and we are maybe the the only institution uh, that is working so hard by dedicating one annual report to this continent. This report has a merit to call for contributors from different horizons and and regions. Not only we have Moroccans on board and Africans, so it's really fully open-minded and collects all standpoints and to reflect together and be as much as possible the mirror of this African richness and wealth. A geopolitical report is not only about writing things, but also it's, it's about know, getting to know each other better. And as a think tank, we need to write the reality, describe it, and draft a good diagnosis. And this will uh, sh help uh, shed some light on decision makers and on political people and also decision makers who eventually will make the final strategic uh, decisions and we can be the ones who sheds a light a deem of lights for everyone who is interested in africa so you spoke about the authors the policy center and others uh, and other african authors and you spoke about uh, connecting everyone and bringing everyone about around the table. Do you think that uh, our Tribune is really playing that role, bringing together uh, the thoughts and minds of Africa? I don't, this is not really our role. Our role is to uh, disseminate the information, disclose the information and share uh, this critical uh, vision and perspective and share it with the policy makers. Um, I'm, I'm not being utopical uth here and talking about information being harmony. What we're trying to do here, we wanna be the mirror of this diversity. And it is right in diversity that we can actually get to know each other better. And by acknowledging this diversity, we can know it better and appreciate it better. And this diversity actually characterizes us and characterizes every one of us, and we should be proud of it. And it's quite enriching. Nizza was talking about mirror. And I remember that the first version of uh, the report was called the mirror of Africa. Mr. Khalid Chagrawi, you are used uh, to the report. You are uh, you kind of used to this report and you involved African colleagues and brothers who have enriched this report and have uh, followed pretty much the same line. So how do you see uh, this report contributing in terms of widening the vision on the continent? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a tribune of the South that sees the South for the South and by the South. Uh, I'm not being chauvinistic here. But this is a kind of uh, uh, position that the report has chosen 
for extremely important reasons, uh, because so far we have been hustled uh, throughout our studies on academia and university studies, the decolonization of our history, of our policy uh, and policy making. But what next? Uh, uh, we may uh, go on criticizing the West, but as Africans, what it is that we do uh, for our own sake. So this is an extraordinary tribute that gives us the opportunity as authors and many other authors from the West uh, and Western Africa, Central Africa and Eastern Africa to talk about this Africa that is so dear to our heart, that is a, a keen interest for us. Uh, in other words, drafting an agenda um, for us by Africans and not import any other agendas uh, from ab abroad. I like the word mirror. It, it is a, a kind of functional uh, type of description. The mirror side of it, you have uh, the feeling in, in, included in it, a lot of policy making, etc., and politics in it. But the extraordinary thing about it is if I, as African, I want to talk about my, about my continents, I want to talk about myself. I have only two alternatives. Either I draft a uh, report as an alternative uh, to this North that has been imposed or imposing itself to me for centuries, and I realize that I am in a critical position, therefore, I'm not on equal footing uh, for the North not for me, so the West is imposing its uh, paradigms, agendas, and positions that I'm not really interested in, but I am compelled to follow and comply with international uh, reports. And this is a second report, an alternative report, that I want to see by myself, through myself, and by myself, and this is where the mirror part will play a very important role. So my beautiful mirror is telling me what would be my best mirror if my uh, fellow citizen from Senegal, from Ethiopia, uh, Mozambique, etc., is feeling and talking? So here we are in this alternative report uh, relationship, and we relate to others, which is quite quite a serene relationship, but sometimes burning because all Africans are getting together for a noble purpose and end. In other words, to propose and to come up with a vision of ourselves, through ourselves and by ourselves. And thirdly, I've been following this report and I want to come back to this evolution in terms of age and gender. So for the first report, if I remember well, it addressed a certain class, a group, age, but this year it's absolutely amazing so and i'm delighted to see the number of women and i want to go further uh, move towards or beyond uh, gender equality or parity and the fact that we have been uh, working in like uh, teaming uh, team him up with uh, teammates that are seniors and juniors in other words uh, uh, working with youth uh, that uh, really master and control a lot of visions and love of digital work, etc. So uh, back and forth between generations. And we have been working with others. So we thought of ourselves uh, as working in a comfort in our comfort zone, but for the youth, they want to make a change. And that work experience with youth was absolutely amazing. And I'm actually keep questioning myself and progressing and moving forward. So here we're talking about the Policy Center for the New South and we're talking about this new South. This is something in fact that we can see in the different articles of the report and those that will read the report will see that there are many terms uh, that are maybe conventionally used or traditionally used are those through which we tend to express a certain a certain bitterness towards the north and towards colonialism or even for others uh, uh, I mean some sort of exploitation based relationships so don't you believe that when reading this report we can see we can see this 
decomplexing of this relationship between the South and the North. Well, I think that's that's the whole point because myself as part of the South, given that this is a report by the South and for the South, so it's already a sort of it's already a, a positive process. I mean, it's definitely not easy that, uh, and it's only been a few years that Africa, the African countries have have gained independence and have been exercising their in, in independence and that have been in sort of indep independence, independence from a cultural economic uh, standpoint to, to name a few. So it's definitely not easy, but here we are moving forward, I'm, I would like to say. And it, it's a sort of group therapy of sorts that we're offering ourselves annually amongst ourselves because we were criticized like, oh, well, they're only African authors. Well, that's perfectly normal. What, what else do you expect? If we don't give ourselves this right to take the floor, well, who's, we're not, we're not going to wait for this right to speak or express ourselves will be given to us. So these are our expressions that are of interest to us. There are some issues that might seem absent, but this is not part of our agenda for the time being, maybe in the future. And obviously there needs to be an edit, I mean, an editorial choice. And But these are topical issues for us. And I'd like to comment on this point. And today we are contributing to creating an, an, an African reference framework in terms of knowledge. We know that uh, education is at the heart of development, and this is where men mindsets are, uh, are forged. And so when we see that, uh, obviously, we are very much aware of the fact that we need to teach our children uh, what Africa is. This is on the one hand. Secondly, we are talking about the North. It is true that our uh, aspirations in the long term is to uh, create balanced relationships. And these balanced relationships are possible to achieve. We are no longer in a, a sort of hierarchical relationship of a dictator and an, and an enforcer. And this is we only we can claim this is we can only only we can claim the stake. This Africa wants to democratize, wants to change. That is aware of what needs to be done in order to change. Obviously, there are still some challenges ahead, and there's some resistance, which is very much linked to this past, which remains present. And so, this is a movement and a crucial moment for our Africa. And this is why it is crucial even vital for people to take this opportunity to say that we are here and we will create Africa of tomorrow. And it starts here and now. So in fact, even for the North, such a document produced by Africans, well, it would be beneficial for the North to read such documents. This is what will present the African vision without which this North is deprived from this perspective that Africa has if the, if the floor isn't given to Africa. On the one hand, we can see how, what, how Africa would like to appear in front of the world. So it's our narrative, our African narrative, and also to say what we are, who we are, but also to say how we perceive the North. I think it's very interesting to see things from this uh, end of the spectrum and for the North to see what our perception is of, of them. And I also would like to add another point, which is credibility. And this is a very credible uh, production of work. But when we present research that is supported by arguments, by research based on history. We have historians, we have a vision that is shared and that is based on a very sound, profound knowledge. I think that this truly endows us with a lot of credibility and that's extremely important. So, so we've spoken about 2020, which was a year marked by the pandemic. And from the very first months, there was a figure shared about the figure the, about the fact that Africa wasn't as touched 
as the rest of the world. And some people were even wondering whether there was actually a pandemic in Africa. But we also had our friends in the north who were predicting the worst case scenarios for Africa. So on the African side, we were we weren't considering things to be so terrible. And then, and off from the North, uh, the, uh, well, we were, it was a whole completely different uh, perspective that, and now a year and a couple of months later, or almost a year and a half, we can even say, it seems that Africa isn't suffering more than any other region in the world. So a question that I would like to ask the both of you to, uh, hear your reactions. Given this outcome, can we state that Africa is resilient? Or is it a little too soon to uh, to make such a statement? It is true that we were, um, we, a disaster was uh, was announced and thankfully these uh, prophecies announced by the north did not were not fulfilled there have been quite a few issues and we can see that the pandemic has uh, struck north north africa southern africa and so there are many questions that need to be posed and we will have to reassess the situation so why these two why these two extremes Another point that's very important is that there are some experiences that were more successful than others. So Senegal and other other, uh, other areas. So this Africa is not necessarily deprived of resources, of common sense also to uh, tackle the situation. And there's also another point important point that we need to admit is that we lack statistics and data. There are many countries that are no longer or do not wish to or have not done or do not will not are not in the reality of figures. However, there there was a disaster that was announced and predicted and that didn't happen. And well, let's hope that, that that doesn't occur. And in fact, what we were spared what to the north africa asia and europe and many other many of the other others have experienced but it did it did awaken our weaknesses our dependencies and so today the necessity to reclaim scientific research to reclaim health policies and outside of the confines of the small uh, outside of smaller confines and i think it's high time to have a health policy at the continental level for africa or in the same vein as when we talk about uh, about uh, silencing the guns or or what not and i think that we need to uh, to uh, stand united to address these situations together. We can take the example, see the example of European countries where the health institutions are extremely important. And despite that fact, they were not able to, uh, to manage the pandemic. There's India that's suffering, Brazil. Obviously things are not, never as simple as they may seem. But this may be alarming, and this can lead us to tackle situations from a different uh, prism and avoid saying that, oh, well, everything's everything's uh, fine. We are we are we are safe and sound. Africa was spared the uh, ho the horrors of the pandemic. But it is true that the future might uh, might we might doesn't mean that the future won't be um, difficult or challenging. It is true that Africa has been resilient. So how i would think it's important to recall its experience with ebola which was very much present and so it different uh, plans and resources to tackle uh, pandemic epidemics had already were already in place so 
it's true that chaos was predicted and that didn't happen. And this is a truly thanks to African resilience. And it's also thanks to African responsiveness from the very beginning. Um, African countries leveraged, triggered all of the available mechanisms, namely solidarity, and which was an incredible mechanism, but also with the involvement of the states, of civil society, and all other stakeholders that were capable to join forces. But there was also an extraordinary role of all African institutions, the African Union, which mobilized regional economic communities that managed to, to a certain extent to, from from the Waimu region to other regions as well. But just like Khalid said, this did reveal quite a few things. In addition to the fragility of our systems, the challenges in regions that are rhythmed by wars and conflict and to fragilize their social fabric. There's also all the children that were deprived from going to school that ended up in I mean, in very, it was a very difficult situation for children as well. So I would like to ask you if this was an opportunity for to a revelatory, revelatory for certain countries such as Morocco that discovered its potential. They could produce their own masks. They were able to manufacture respiratory respiratory devices, and even surpassed uh, certain countries of the North in terms of vaccination. So sometimes, I mean, it, this there there's a silver lining, but wasn't, could we say that this was an opportunity where countries discovered uh, some assets and potential that they had? So it's true that Morocco, the case of Morocco is quite striking. We saw that this potential, the potential of the youth uh, that really set mobilized to provide solutions uh, and this uh, included the manufacture of masks of respirators just to name a few examples and when we were talking about uh, when we were talking about the regional economic communities uh, there are different uh, there are different uh, there are different specificities. I mean, there are some borders that don't exist. There are some eth some ethnic groups in this on each side of the border that uh, were that were that were living that their whose means of subsistence uh, were completely challenged. And so, youth had, were truly able to contribute to, in, immensely to to this effort. So it's incredible to see how youth leverage digitalization, which is an incredible niche niche market. And so in fact, the future will, is, will be based on the digital technology. So youth anticipated to try to find solutions and address certain issues. And, and in addition, they contributed to creating new dynamics to bring uh, trans-border ethnic groups together and in the future, what we may expect, but provided that we draw the necessary lessons to uh, to not to avoid hampering all of this progress and rather to promote them and, and foster them to continue pushing forward. And this could be at the local level, but also the territorial, regional, and even continental level. So w these alarming reports uh, uh, or certain newspapers on Africa's prospects remind us of the same alarming discourse um, that we've already heard before on the geopolitical report, uh, geopolitical reports of the past. But our econ economist colleagues that will be soon publishing their economic report in a few weeks will uh, further delve into this African issue. And so when you talk to when you take a look at some of some some literature from the north or also from the south, we can we tend to see this the future demographics of Africa as an issue, as a sort of ogre that will be devouring Europe. And it's as if this uh, this uh, same uh, demographic dynamic, if it does take place as 
as it, as it should or as it will is an opportunity for us Africans. And it's true that this is why I said that we needed to overcome these paradigms and agendas that have been imposed on us. And so the agenda of the, uh, the demographic agenda is, 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 is specific to Afri Africa. And it's true that uh, in 2050, 25% of the, Af the global population will be African in, in a time when the Western, uh, Western world, there's an aging of the population and in fact, mortality or the mortality rates in some countries, some European countries is the one of the main leading reasons is is age, whether it's Italy or many other uh, European countries. So this age issue is very important. It's important to regulate things, to control things, to implement policies and to prepare for these, these youth because each uh, birth today needs each each new uh, newborn well this uh, newborn child is obviously needs to have rights need to benefit from education uh, and whatnot so we need to prepare ourselves and the, and the more youth we have well we need to apprehend their demands and expectations which is perfectly normal so now obviously now if we go beyond this alarming agenda we need to see things from a more positive and optimistic outlook so in the same vein there is this issue of demographics economic migration economic weakness and so i'm wondering whether this issue of migration is perfectly normal and at this i mean this is something that the world has always experienced and will always experience it. If there was, if there wasn't any migration, we wouldn't have Europe as we know it today. If, if our collective grandma Lucy hadn't migrated and hadn't uh, led to hadn't led to another our the Homo sapiens sapiens that was discovered in Morocco, well, maybe we wouldn't have had new on Neanderthal. Uh, men in Europe are humanoids. So this is, yes, perfectly normal. So there are certain things that would need to be regulated and managed. However, it is not an issue. In fact, 96% of the migration flows in Africa remain in Africa. Only 46% cross the border. And so when there, and everyone is alarmed and this it's presented as a major crisis and so we've had the pandemic, we've had resilient, we've seen resilience, it's true, and we've seen incredible public policies. I mean, it's important to pay tribute to uh, countries. I mean, for example, in Morocco, we can see health, education, masks, or, or the manufacture, or elsewhere, the manufacture, the manufa manufacture of of different drugs. I mean, we've we've seen the nationalization of of drugs from antibiotics or whatnot that have been completely nationalized, which is really a great achievement. There are vaccines, and there are two other very important aspects that should not be neglected: was that the world was locked down. So not having, for not having closed borders. I mean, and despite all of the issues, I mean, we local producers, local manufacturers, were able to were able to prevail. And what uh, Madame Ms. has spoke about, which is absolutely essential, is education. I mean, I must admit that we've had incredible experiences. So at the University of Mohammed VI, we've had screens and and devices and equipment, and it's true that it's both complicated and complicated and not so easy. But no, they still managed to push through. So the University of Mohammed VI did a great job. Television, television channels got involved. Everyone uh, may con everyone contributed, and so. This is, there was this collective effort, this collective involvement. And in fact, the, it was thanks to the youth. The, and they, in fact, they're a lot more capable of using them. For example, I'm talking of people of my age who saying, so, oh, what's all this issue? What, what's all this business of online classes, online schooling? But 
it's incredible to see how our children adapted, how youth adapted. They are like, you know, fish in the water. So it's true that people from an, an older generation maybe had a hard time grasping, grappling with all this. But when we see this experience in Morocco, well, this reveals that our youth were very resilient and they were like fish in water. And so just a few words on the de demographics. So just, just in, a, in a brief nutshell. So we, you discussed the, the case of Morocco and the INDH, so the Deve Investment in Human. I believe that the notion of human development is more timely than, than ever. We have youth, but we also knew, need the youth that, could, that needs to be prosperous and move forward and have a promising future and be also full actors of the development of their country. And, and this requires time. And there is a problem that we need to acknowledge. It could be a wealth and it's great wealth and richness and great opportunity for the future, but we need to invest heavily in human development, in uh, food security and good governance, because I don't think that Africa is lacking resources. Africa is actually uh, lacking of governors. Um, this is, in order to make a link with Absaco, this is uh, the way to pave and the way to pave the way towards a sustainable um, development and evolution of the uh, of the population to to also fill in the gaps not only between women and men but also between the rural world and the urban world and there are so many challenges in here and african citizens men and women are fully aware of all these challenges that we need to have agendas with priorities uh, in this regard when I look through the report, uh, some will blame us maybe for that, but uh, of well, because COVID is only one part of the five five chapters. In one of the opening articles, we're saying and explaining that uh, uh, in Africa there was uh, it was it was the COVID nineteen crisis, but not only. We spoke about our, our Africa like it actually wants to see itself and acknowledge itself and recognize itself. But there were some issues, challenges that were there prior to COVID. I'm wondering whether this document should have been fully dedicated to the pandemics because it actually describes that 2020 uh, health uh, pandemic crisis. Well, I think that we cannot uh, go on forever hiding behind the pandemic and on the very contrary the pandemic allowed us to um, really gain new momentums and start from scratch and think out of the box because before we were kind of in this fatalistic kind of approach and we took things for granted. Now everything is reviving. Africanism, this sense and feeling of ownership uh, and started to actually uh, doing things and making things happen because we were faced with a challenge, with a threat. And this is an extraordinary feeling at really, and the pandemic revealed the possibility for us to talk about our problems without any complex and shamelessly because it really brought something together. It really built a trust and a confidence and it really nourished love in our hearts. And from that time on, uh, the, uh, the um, kind of untrust, got, we got rid of the untrust type of feeling uh, because it really it prevented us from talking together before. And the virus, helped us. It really put us all on an equal footing. We saw the uh, rich Europe and West uh, uh, at its knees. And the virus reaffirmed us in what we really are as human beings. Uh, yes, uh, we were actually uh, struck by the virus and we were put on an equal footing by the, uh, the, the virus. Yes, indeed. And we actually realized and acknowledged uh, the value added for, of if each one of us, regardless of who we are and what we, where we come from. Well, but in the literature, uh, COVID was like uh, the goat. Like, um, 
we saw or heard some argue that it's because of COVID that we were not able to achieve these objectives. In other words, um, get rid of arms in 2020. Does it really depend that heavily on COVID? Well, let me come back to my first love. To criticize our bodies and institutions, our big brothers. Yes, that is where the shoe pinches. We come up with extraordinary uh, programs, uh, wishful thinkings with uh, incredible uh, lightning type of objectives, but we hardly managed to achieve them. We know or we knew that in 2019 that we were not going to make uh, the 2020 objectives. Central Africa, since its independence, have never been living in peace. Uh, not two years in a row up to now, Congo, since its actual independence and in the aftermath of its independence has been living in blood. And it still is the case. In the 16 and 17, it was the Shaba, and now it's the Gui Etui. Anyways, Nigeria, is, since its uh, independence, it was separatism in the 70s. It was this north that is a bastion of great civilization, a cradle of civilization, and, and production of knowledge into in, in amazing international relations, but also a cradle for incredible instability and terrorism. Mali. Mali has been living in peace for some time, for some, uh, for some couple of years. Uh, maybe they, they are the heirs of the great uh, Malian Empire. But since 2014, things have changed drastically. So there is a huge issue here, and it really affects and has an impact on the whole space, an African space. And we knew uh, very well that we're not going to achieve the objective, but put it, put the blame on COVID only would be not responsible on our, on our side. Well, assuming that all the objectives uh, that, well, well, I'd say that all the programs that have been designed by African uh, rulers uh, have not been achieved because of lack of governance, also pooling resources, but because there is another argument that I'd like to come up with. Yes, I do criticize the West, but at a certain point, I need to make my own self-criticism. So what, since the 60s or maybe 50s, we've been independent. And if you still want to stick and remain and stay in that independence mindset, it's our problem. It's really our cup of tea. And we know that the West is even telling us, no, you guys need to find your own homegrown solutions. I'm not there for you to tailor made your own solutions. So let's negotiate with our partners. Currently and today, um, international relationships are gaining a great momentum. We turn to new forces like China and new powers like Russia. Uh, a lot of African countries uh, do see themselves so differently on a kind of prospect differently uh, take the example of Rwanda, regardless of what's going on internally, but its position towards the international world is really uh, absolutely amazing, and it's a real momentum. So you give me that opportunity to uh, talk about something else that is very important in our African space. I will not give names to this report, but the presence of some is quite classical, and the return uh, back or the brain uh, gain of some who have returned home, the a rivalry of foreign powers. So my, my question is whether Africa uh, and its role as uh, uh, captor or dragger of international influence, or is it going to be only an Africa that will stay the same. Africa is about two things, the space, geography, the continent. And maybe we see that it could also be a theater of war with others or between others. So South Africa as an Africa, a leading country as an actor in international relations, do they actually play a role of actors and theater at the same time? Or is it only a space of theater of others? 
Well, I think you get, bring another better answer to this question, but coming back to the COVID-19 issue, we've seen how the international cooperation was uh, triggered and that was an, an opportunity for international powers that had already started, by the way, when we talk about the China, Russia, Oh, China, rather China, Africa reports, uh, Russia, Africa reports. We see how uh, keen uh, uh, international powers are interested on how keen they are on Africa and their strategic vision on Africa. So this demography that we're actually presenting or introducing as a problem is a, an attraction element namely for those aging continents on needs, a human potential and human resource, but also for other natural resources that the uh, continent is so flourishing of. And this is why I insist on this issue of rivalry when we talk about China and Russia. Yes, very much so. This is a, a space of international rivalry. And how do Africans manage that space of theirs knowing that within the continent there are rivalries that are growing and that are relating and confronting themselves and really did not uh, got a, did not reach to a shape due to historical uh, reasons uh, linked to historical path and this this what makes the momentum be engaged uh, not only from the positive side but negative side also on, to my mind, there are there's a huge propaganda and communication that really go beyond the real impact of international powers on Africa. When you see, like, look at COVID, for instance, you see that the African Development Fund has injected and invested much more money than other international powers. So we should really uh, look at this with a lot of care and in, in, in other words the impact of international powers in Africa yeah of course but let's say let's face it we are offering the ground for those rivalries in terms of management of these relationships internationally or in the international relations arena the issue of the uh, uh, continent African be it uh, Japan, Africa with TICAD, uh, America, the United States, Africa, Russia, or China, Africa. It does reflect, well, one state on the one hand and uh, 50 and so many other states on the other hand. So the African Union is not speaking up with one single voice and is not making its voice heard with our domestic issues and rivalries. It really is a challenge and it's jeopardizing a relationship with the international relations and inter international powers. Yes, yeah, sure. The problem or difficulties to bring about, uh, for instance, the EU member states or 27 member states, are we talking about the same thing? Well, it's true that Europe uh, do not agree on some issues, but when it comes down to uh, talk about a uh, a uh, food production they can agree and come together on a solidarity basis what about migration they do not agree we have seen uh, the construction of walls so what about 54 african countries they need to speak up with the same voice uh, let's not overlook the economic agenda if we look at the inter-African trade, these trade levels are almost insignificant and, and they're really peanuts, if I may say so. So how can we talk on with the same voice, whereas we have on a state basis, it dependence is on the West and the Zleka and the free uh, economic zone of Africa has come up to or has been ratified to address those needs to have a economic space that will promote and forward trade between African states. What about the uh, contribution of this free trade uh, uh, zone, uh, African free trade zone area? 
will our political rivalries make uh, help the success or allow the success of uh, the free trade zone, African free trade zone area? And what about the role or place of all these uh, foreign uh, powers that are investing and breaking into Africa? Is it an intra-African thing? Is it a relationship? It's about the relation between African states? And the question I'm asking, when you spoke about solidarity of superpowers, China sending out vaccines to Africa, Well, sometimes these are kind of like caricatures sending out 500,000 doses from China to Africa. Well, this solidarity could have been applauded and awarded if it was only for humanitarian reasons, but this is not only for the sake of Africa or for Africa's eyes only we are seeing that this is shifting to a political re, uh, uh, momentum. Uh, so who's going to be more showing more solidarity towards Africa? I'm going to do better than you. So you see that uh, powers or foreign powers are competing to operate in Africa on this issue uh, of, uh, uh, you know, sanitary crisis, is it really uh, for the sake of Africa and for helping Africa? Well, the the aid coming from, uh, uh, from foreign uh, countries is another aid that will add on to the on existing debt. So another form of increasing the debt. So at the end of the day, we'll have to pay. Uh, to pay uh, the accumulation of the debt, and that is where the shoe pinches. Uh, uh, and this is due maybe to the forms of governance uh, growing in Africa. I'm shifting the question from you to Nizha. You wrote an article, Nizha, on uh, African solidarity, if I'm not mistaken. And you spoke about, uh, I quote, of African solidarity. And this reminds me of the preamble of the Moroccan constitution that qualifies Africa as a space of cooperation and solidarity. So can you tell us more about this, about this concept of uh, more policy of uh, cooperation and solid solidarity? and you refer to the COVID crisis, exactly. Maybe I can take it a step further. So I experienced the ad, the uh, advent uh, of uh, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, and since his accession to the throne and his uh, vision of South-South development has been a guiding principle that has been ever present. So it's true that there's this vision that has uh, guided Morocco's uh, of uh, politics and in fact the convention that you just mentioned has corroborated this so this is constitutional it's a strategic choice a constitutional choice that is which recognizes this africa this africanness and this value of solidarity which is the bedrock of already it's a great value which is firmly rooted in our african cultures and i am stressing the fact that i'm talking about our cultures in plural so in addition, in these times of crisis, it has revealed how we can collectively provide solutions to mitigate the impact of such crises. Crisis has marked a time in our history, but I would even mention a sort of continuity. It was this a moment where we triggered some mechanisms, and this is why I, I mean, you spoke about the Constitution, I spoke about the advent of His Majesty the King and his strategic vision, and I would simply add that it is all of this materializes through fundamental factors. I might just mention a few. There is also Morocco's return to its institutional home since 2017. There is also the reflection of this vision within institutions. So the, today, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation 
is an African too. So African is also part of the name of the ministry. And so this is a very strong signal that's given or this testifies to the importance of the continent. And there's also the dimension of, of the humane dimension, the, visit, the visits and tours, but also investment. We are the leading investor in investor and we're the leading investor in Africa. And we have also, we have also tackled the topic of spirituality. We have some specific features as Africans, and so the strengthening of these African of these spiritual ties, and so as such, our our African solidarity transcends where everything that's situational, and rather is marked turns focuses on what unites us, and which is the real essence of these relations. And I'd like to add to that the presence of several thousands of African students, and so the futures elite. Well, we are contributing collectively to training them within our institutions, our academies, our universities. We also have exchange programs. So the vision of the future is quite present. Maybe it hasn't yet uh, taken form you know, in dec official declarations, even if the African Union is uh, tackling this work. And I also would like to recall that during COVID, there's the issue of solidarity, which has not only been done domestically, but it even went beyond because Morocco, under the uh, higher instructions of His Majesty the King, created uh, air bridges to send equipment and also to to deliver vaccines. So we are truly based on, we are truly involved in a, in, in, in this, uh, in this dynamic, in this uh, strong involvement uh, in and with Africa, and also it's important to pay tribute to Africa. And Padris Lumumba, uh, who in 1960, and in fact, this is the last uh, Congress during one of the, his last uh, times taking the floor, he spoke about Africa at the service of the people. So there's this solidarity that is ever present, and it's important for us to recall this. It's important for this to be institutionalized. It needs to be fitted with the proper resources to be firmly rooted and also to be able to produce the uh, desired outcomes and at a large scale. So you spoke about the solid, spiritual action and the framework of this uh, solidarity. So what, what could you say, Mr. Khalid, on this Moroccan project? So I think it's today something that's quite concrete as far as Morocco's fight against extremism. And the way Morocco chose to take the route of training imams and as to choose you know that I would like to say that Africans are religious people at, by by default, by nature. I mean, regardless of our religious or prophetic beliefs, but we are societies that are extremely religious in Africa, from the north, south, east, west, and center. And there are many states, in fact, that have tried to import or have been imposed or were under the mire of this of of states that were um, that were. That were maybe not that didn't have religious uh, religious founding, but the states in its uh, in its sovereign functions uh, sort of lost uh, lost the the control on uh, on the religious aspects, and so there are many issues that arise that have arised, and so Morocco has always maintained this very uh, strong relation between the central government and religion not so much in terms of imposing religion, but rather management of the religious space in the religious affairs in the public space, because this requires monitoring this. And this Africa also, this should be recalled, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Sudan, from Khartoum all the way to the Atlantic, where there are the majority of Sunni Muslims in the world and within Sunnism and where there is a majority of Malik, Malik where is the majority of Malikism. And so this uh, corpus is, is, is 
mainly from Morocco. And so we are in this uh, perfectly normal continuity. So we have this con example of Morocco, which is always suggested within, within our state, has, has always been properly managed, which is already properly managed religious affairs in the public space. And so this is part of a public policy. And we're providing the proper resources, the the mosques that are that are going to be built. The and this is something that's common in other countries as well. Turkey does this in a completely different manner, which is a lot more imposing. So in Morocco, it's the idea is to preserve uh, traditions. So yes, to be progressive. Today we have female morshidats. Uh, we have women that arrive uh, in the in the religious space, which is which is a major shift. And so, and this is something that we're also developing with our African uh, brother and sister countries. So we are adapting, but at the same time, this extremism, I and mean, we, we, it's true that there seems to be a real ignorance of religion on, on behalf of these extremists. And this reminds me that some, in this fight against terrorism, we tend to address the symptoms and not the root causes. Would you say that this is true? So you've uh, truly pinpointed the real issue at hand here. And here there's nothing new. Sometimes when we talk about what happens in Mozambique, we forget, to, we, we tend to talk about the religious terrorism and we t tend to forget that there was a terrible civil war 40 years ago that lasted more than eight years. And these were not uh, uh, extreme uh, Islamists, but these were Christians. And when you see the map of Africa, you can see the map of, of, uh, of coups. And uh, there's a sort of mirror so the sort of there seems to be a mirror of the terrorism terrorism map that is that is a, a mirror of the countries that have suffered from coups. So there are some causes that are are a lot more deeply rooted than what appears at the surface. So either these are coups or military regimes. So there seems to be a correlation. So just to conclude my point. So what our continent is experiencing today with all of the impact, namely the, the IDPs. Some of the most impacted uh, people are women and children that need to be uh, given particular attention. And so we also know that solving these issues, we're talking about literature, there's the redistribution of wealth, but there's also the maritime routes and all of the illegal trafficking that uh, that involves corruption and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, plates. And so, what's important is to fight for an equal Africa. When I talk, when I mean equal, I'm alluding to gender because there is a female leadership in Africa that's emerging that's absolutely exceptional. And as you've underlined in the beginning, our narrative should also be rewritten based on these aspirations to be once again a mirror of this plural and rich Africa. So I'd like to get back to this issue of, of extremism and terrorism. So uh, you wrote an article about the Sadek, the Sadek which reminds us of uh, Mozambique. And so there was a Sadek uh, this summit recently. And so in Mozambique, in 2019, 2019 and 2020, we've seen the the resurgence of the Shabab. Uh, sometimes we, they're called Al Jama, and sometimes it's Al Ansaru. So they have different; they take on different names. This uh, this trend didn't, didn't appear ex nihilo. So these people are here.
we have discussed all of these uh, issues that are eating away at Africa. It's also important to talk about the effects of the region. In fact, we tend to forget that uh, Mozambique is in East Africa and in the south there's the Indian Ocean. And so this is an ocean that has a very particular relationship with many religious um, trends and either from India or from the Arab Muslim world. The, the second point is that there is a Muslim, uh, an ancestral uh, Muslim community, uh, which represents about 14, 15% of the population that lives in an area that was pretty much forgotten by the central administration and where there has been a sort of sort of abandoning in a sort of sense of this region. And so these borders have also experienced the certain uh, trends and chronic instabilities. And if this is linked to the emergence or the discovery of gas or oil or natural resources, well, here we have the perfect mix for a for things to explode, whether it's bad governance or leaving a region behind or misunderstanding the impact of history in the region. And this is extremely important when we tend to forget a community when there is no because, I mean, obvi uh, the history is obvious and what, as long as these contradictions have not been addressed, they will emerge. And so on the one hand, we have we have different uh, trends. We have the Congo and the north, there's Kenya and Somalia and there's the Indian Ocean. So there are many regions that can lead us to this. And so now uh, our, our session is coming to an end. I would like to thank you, Madam Nezha, Mr. Khalid, for your uh, participation. I uh, hope that we were able to answer most of your questions, even if we didn't have uh, um, the time to take uh, the uh,
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Kerry and Melania, with the Executive President of, of the Policy Center for the New South, uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers that have come from different horizons that, that have taken part in this uh, fifth edition of uh, APSACO on this recurring theme, a priority theme today in Africa, which is women, peace and security. had the participation of about 40 distinguished uh, panelists and speakers that, has, that were all very diverse, uh, uh, allowed us to have very rich, diverse, and sometimes even controversial uh, discussions. I am uh, firmly convinced that this conference has allowed us to get a detailed and general idea of uh, the actions undertaken by the international community for the enforcement of the UN's Women, Peace and Security Agenda, particularly in Africa. I also would like to thank the participants who have also contributed effectively and efficiently to the discussion by asking very relevant and topical questions that have enriched the debates and the very relevant analyses made by our various speakers. So overall, the discussions and debates that were uh, particularly fruitful, as I've mentioned, were geared around to three specific realities for Africa. First, there's the uh, interesting and paradox interesting situation given that there are women which are the most exposed to violence in Africa and at the same time women are underrepresented in the UN and international mechanisms for peacekeeping or peace building. And there seems to be persistence and predominance of the absence or lack of access to decision-making mechanisms in, in de decision-making roles in a certain number of countries. So women are underrepresented in the defense and security organizations. The second reality is that it is true that there are there is some progress that's been made, uh, particularly from an institutional standpoint. And this is a fundamental issue because as you all know, there's the 1325 resolution of the UN, of the UN Security Council has made it possible to create a reference framework. And on this basis, a certain number of countries, particularly Africa, in Africa developed uh, uh, NAPs and national action plans. And there are be between 25 to 30 countries uh, of about 80 countries worldwide, which is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, substantial. Now, there are quite a few factors that the enforcement of the agenda seems to be seems to be experienced seems to be uh, blocked at there is a sort of model uh, based crisis for the implementation of these uh, national and regional action plans given the diversity of the national uh, specificities there's no one size fits all model that can be applied using the same procedures in all African countries. And the third reality is that our conference has made it possible to discuss the uh, strengthening of the gains and also the solutions that can be uh, provided or envisaged for a gender outlook that is uh, uh, sustainable and longstanding. And one of the, one of the, one of the possible solutions to strengthen the institutional capacities of the states with respect to the development and preparation of procedures and of also of these national plans. I also would like to underline that 
everything that's been discussed during these conference in this fifth edition will be uh, taken will be noted in a report that will be published and th which will be in just a few weeks so before officially before closing this officially this uh, fifth edition i would like to extend my warmest thanks to the uh, policy center for the new south staff that has been organizing all the events and conducting uh, the uh, uh, great successful event and i would like to thank the interpreters and uh, thank you all for your participation and active presence and attendance and we'll meet you next year for the sixth edition thank you